Assalamu alaikum and greetings to everyone. Uh, welcome to MARC, the Mullah Asghar Library and Resource Center for our program, Conversations with Authors. My name is Shabir Jaffa and I'm one of the directors here. Every month, we invite an author or an academic from the Muslim community to join us, talk about their work and answer some questions. If you'd like to know more about what we do at MARC, please visit the website at markresource.org. That's markresource.org. You can also sign up uh, to receive news of our future events and access videos of our past interviews and academics uh, with academics and authors. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our author for today's program. Uh, I have some questions for him. And after that, I'll turn it over to you, our listeners, so that you can ask him questions or, or comment on his work. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function and text your questions to me. That's the chat function on Zoom. Uh, it's very simple to use. Or if you want to ask a question orally, uh, please click on the little hand icon to let me know. So now let's meet uh, today's author. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce you all to Professor Abdul Sharif, who is joining us from Dar es Salaam, uh, where it is almost dinner time. And I believe, Professor, you normally reside in Zanzibar, but you're in Dar es Salaam today. Well, I spend half, um, my time almost halfway, because I like to be in Zanzibar, but my grandchildren are in Dar es Salaam. That's a good reason to be in Dar. <laughs> yes. Um, so a brief introduction. Uh, Abdul Sharif was born and educated in Zanzibar. He studied at UCLA, University of California in Los Angeles, and at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He taught at the University of Dar es Salaam from 1969 to 1991, and was the principal curator of the Zanzibar Museum from 93 to 2005, as well as the executive director of the Zanzibar Indian Ocean Research Institute. He published Slaves, Spices and Ivory in Zanzibar, in 1987, the Tao cultures of the Indian Ocean in 2010, and that's going to be the subject of our discussion today. He co-authored Transition from Slavery in Zanzibar and Mauritius uh, in 2017. He edited or co-edited um, the Zanzibar under colonial rule in 1991 and the history and conservation of Zanzibar Stonetown in 95. And finally, the Indian Ocean, Oceanic Connections and the Creation of New Societies in 2014. As well as that, he has written numerous scholarly articles. So let's bring him in now, Professor Sharif. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Alaikum salam. It is quite an honor to be invited to this uh, um, uh, screen. I didn't expect especially the subject, but we will go into the subject later. Yeah, well, I do have to thank a couple of people for introducing me to you or, or, or for suggesting that I invite you to our program. And that is specifically uh, Shokud Molu, uh, who himself hails from, from Zanzibar, as well as uh, Nazmul Bay Damji, uh, one of my friends here in Toronto. Um, thank you for those. Thank you to those gentlemen for suggesting uh, I call you. Um, I have to say, Professor, uh, that having read this book from cover to cover, it is one of the most remarkable books I have ever read. And, uh, you know, I've read a lot of history books. The research and scholarly endeavor that you must have put into writing in, uh, writing it is, is so evident. I personally was woefully ignorant of this period of history of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and as a result, I learned so much that is new and interesting. So, before I say anything else, I have to thank you for writing it. You're very welcome. Um, tell us a little, about, a little bit about your journey towards becoming an academic and an author and towards writing this book. What, what, what prompted you to write? Well, I think actually I started off from Zanzibar, you know, going through the school and so on. And at that time I decided, although my family was all very uh, mercantile, you know, the, uh, big business uh, people. Yeah. But I wanted to be a teacher. And my father was horrified when he heard it. But he said, okay, you go ahead. We'll see when you come back. And then, of course, by the time I 
came to finish the revolution had occurred. And he himself was out of the country. And he thought actually in the long run, it really turned out well. But then I did not become an ordinary, an ordinary uh, school teacher uh, because, uh, because of the revolution, I took on more studies and went on to do uh, up to PhD. And then when I finished that, I went into uh, to work in the university. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, in your introduction uh, to the book, you present us with an expression called long durée, uh, a French word. The crux of the idea of that idea is to examine extended periods of time and draw conclusions from historical trends and patterns. And the objective is to understand and the truly great movements, not moments, but movements of history. Um, it focuses on the relationship between human beings and their environment when history is made, but not consciously. How did this particular academic approach, the long durée, uh, how did this lend itself to your examination of the history of the Indian Ocean, uh, specifically its diverse people and culture? Yeah, thank you. And I must say, actually, for you to ask me such a question was surprising uh, because uh, it, it, under, it shows actually you have really a good understanding of the study of history and how it is normally treated and that you would pick up on this methodology question. Quite often, history tends to be in terms of rulers and dates. And I found that in some ways, um, not repugnant, I mean, it was sort of normal, but this is how we were taught uh, for a long time. But, and I must say that in the process of going learning uh, history itself, I began to be aware also of the Marxist methodology, which also talks of social movements, uh, the ordinary people, how they make history and so on. Uh, so there was that kind of background and I began to be very critical of histories that talk about rulers and dates. Mm -hmm. uh, so now when I came to start reading on the Indian Ocean, I was introduced to um, this, uh, lo the long durée by in fact, an Indian historian who was teaching at uh, London, um, who has written a book on, on the Indian Ocean as well. And he mentioned that phrase, long durée. And I said, this is what really fits uh, into what I have been thinking. Yes. And so I began to read it more closely. And here, particularly, is that when you think of one person making these decisions and changing the history of, of a people, yeah. you're ignoring that everybody in the society who also play their role in the history. And therefore, I began to look at these long period uh, emergence of groups and group interests and how they they actually create history and create history. Histories are not really made of policies and declarations, but right. of what the people do and say on in ordinary days. So yeah. this is how I began to pick up and begin to feel that that is actually precisely what I need for Indian Ocean history. Right. Thank you for that. I and just just very quickly for the benefit of our listeners, those of you who haven't read this wonderful book. Um, the professor focuses on a period of history in the prior to the 15th century in the Indian Ocean when the peoples of the Swahili coast, i.e. the East African coast, now I guess from Somalia down to Mozambique, uh, traded and communed with people from the uh, Arabian Peninsula, um, Yemen and Saudi and, 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 and Oman, uh, as well as people from the South Asian uh, Western coast, which is, uh, you know, uh, I guess, Pakistan and Gujarat, all the way down to Kerala. Um, and not only that, they also traded with people in, in Indonesia. But the, um, the, the key point of this is to say how these people worked together and, and traded together without trying to dominate um, one civilization over the other, until, of course, the time 
that the Portuguese and the Europeans arrived. And, and we'll go into that later, but just to give some background to our, our listeners, what, what uh, the book is about. So in, uh, in chapter two, Professor, you quote a man by the name of Aniruddha Gupta, um, where you say, I quote, the sea has played a vibrant role in the life and psyche of coastal people and has given rise to a distinctive maritime culture that differs fundamentally from the continental one. Uh, another quote, where the plow furrows the land, swords usually clash. Where boats ply, commerce usually follows. And as I said, that's from Aniruddha Gupta. Um, do you think that that quote is true of all literal people or more applicable to those of the Indian Ocean? Well, I think to some extent it is uh, applicable to to all the, um, the coastal uh, people around the world, yeah. because by definition, uh, once you get onto the boat, you are free to move up and down, at least up and down your own coast. Right. And therefore you are able to develop a common culture over a long uh, area. As you mentioned yourself, that the Swahili culture extends yeah. from Southern Somalia all the way to Mozambique. Right. Now that came about because these people along the coast who were fishermen, and then they began to trade on a small scale, um, they, but they would be trading along this coast and they had that kind of uh, uh, freedom to, to move along the coast. So that was one. But in this case, in, the, in our case, particularly the Indian Ocean, uh, the Swahili coast, is that there is one um, further kind of uh, dimension that it was not moving only up and down the coast, but we also had the monsoons, the monsoon right. winds, yes. which blow very, very regularly, very predictably almost. Um, it uh, blows in one direction, one season, and then two or three months later, it reverses and comes back all the way from a long distance. So that now provided an opportunity for people of this coast to travel across the ocean to Arabia, to the Persian Gulf, to India. Yes. And the people from there also, who are the same like the Swahili, were able to come to East Africa seasonally. And it was quite predictable. I would know by December, I expect the, the Daos to begin to come to Zanzibar. Yeah. Uh, and so by January, February, the port is full and even yeah. the town changes come, completely. Right. So now this provided cross-continental kind of connection that doesn't occur everywhere uh, easily uh, when, when there is no um, reliable wind that can take you and bring you back even in the same year. Right. So this, there, there is a particular uh, advantage to the East African coast, the, the Indian Ocean, because of the monsoons, which are reliable. Right. Um, for the benefit of our listeners, both those who live in East Africa currently, as well as those who have lived in East Africa, there was a, an interesting uh, fact that you, uh, you revealed in chapter four, when you said, um, I quote, Daos returned with Indian merchandise like Mangalore red clay roof tiles, which became popular in East Africa during the 20th century. Um, growing up in Uganda, as I did, I always assumed that these distinctive red tiles uh, came from somewhere in Africa. Um, but the fact that they came directly from India, Mangalore, uh, and they were packed and, and shipped on Daos, is something I don't think many of us realize. I mean, how, how, how did those Daos take such heavy items uh, across the seas? T tell us more about that, please. Yes, actually, in terms of my own knowledge, yeah, uh, I, I don't think uh, these tiles were brought in to East Africa from India before right. the coming of the British. Okay. It is a, it is a new development. Right. Previously, there was other kind of trade. Yes. Uh, from, from India, it was cloth. 
cloth and then a lot of other things, foodstuffs and so on. That's but cloth spices. was really a major mm -hmm. one. Spices from East Africa uh, clubs and so on. Yeah. And but these styles, it seems to have come particularly with the British, because I think the earliest buildings that were actually, uh, because previously the people along the coast and in the interior, they used um, uh, coconut uh, palms, um, okay. various kind of uh, uh, leaves and uh, those kind of things to do the, the, to do the roof, which is yeah. light, but they are easily available and uh, they can be replaced every few years. Right. So anything that was cheap was used. Yeah. So tiles became something new. Yeah. Previously, there, there were some houses along the East African coast, the stone houses, that could build actually a flat roof hmm. um, using uh, mangrove poles to support uh, stone and mud kind of roof. Right. So that could be done. And in fact, in Kilwa, you even have domes that appeared in the, in the 14th century in, in Kilwa. So there are other kind of roofs, but the, these kind of tiles, um, they seem to be quite specific to the coming of the colonial uh, British officials who yeah. brought it and popularized it along the coast and then they even went into, into the interior. Well, I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers, those of us who no longer live in East Africa, those particular red tiles that, that uh, were on top of the roofs of, of our houses there. Um, talking about the, the photos and illustrations in your book are fascinating. They really help to bring your narrative to life. Um, for example, the black and white photo in chapter four of Omani sailors uh, on their dhow in Zanzibar Harbor, this one here, um, and um, the other one of a Suri captain and his agent sharing coffee on the deck of a Dao in Zanzibar, uh, in the harbor. Um, the book is littered with, with wonderful photos like this. Tell us about your quest to find and reproduce such photos in this book. Mm. I think the way it came about is that when I was writing my book on uh, the slaves, spices and ivory, um, I wrote the whole text. It took a long time for me to revise uh, because I got diverted. Yeah. But when I finally finished the text, I went to look for um, the publisher. Yeah. Uh, and the, I knew one who, who had expressed an interest before. So I saw him, I gave him the manuscript. It was a pl plain manuscript. And he was already familiar with my work. So he said, yes, I'm interested in this. And then I very shyly asked, can we include at least one illustration in this? Because normally these illustrations are not very common in scholarly books. Mm. You don't find them in scholarly books. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, scholars apparently believe that your word counts more than a photograph. Although we know that photographs will count a thousand words. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, what I was surprised was that when I said, can you include one photograph? He told me, bring me 30. Hmm. I was surprised. I said, but this will increase the cost. And he said, yes, but it will also increase uh, the sales. Hmm. So I went straight back to the library, went and collected all these illustrations that I could find uh, from these old books, photographs and so on, and submitted. And so they were reproduced uh, in that first book, a lot of good illustrations. When it comes to the second book, I was determined now I was the master. I wrote this text. I didn't care if they refused to publish. I wanted to write what I wanted to write. I wanted to publish, but with a lot of photographs. And I insisted that some of these will have to be colored because I want to show the colors of the people as well. Yes because otherwise people make assumptions about the Indians look like this, the Af Africans look like this, uh, and so on. I wanted the colors as well to come. So when I went to see another publisher, I said, I have this text, but I want so many. And there were a lot of them. I think there are about 80 illustrations, probably in that book. Yeah. I really splurged in there. And he accepted, and they did a really a good job 
in terms of public. The printing actually was done in India. So the production of the book was from India. It is really yeah. quite good quality. Yes. So this is why. And since then, actually, I've become attached to using illustrations yes. in all my writings. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the books that I'm writing now, I always have space for the photographs. Yeah, I, 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 it's a great idea. As I said earlier, it, it certainly brings your narration to life. Um, the other thing, fascinating thing I learned uh, this time in chapter six, uh, and I quote, you, you say, before the European expansion into the Indian Ocean, most of the sailing boats in this and, and, and sailing vessels were not nailed, but planks were sewn together. Stitching was done using easily available koi ropes from the ubiquitous coconut palm. How on earth do you construct a boat by sewing the planks together and, and then preventing it from leaking? I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> yes, actually, many of the Europeans, the first Europeans, even before the Portuguese, yeah. uh, the Europeans and even some of the Arabs coming from Morocco, yeah. Ibn Abbas, for example, they commented that these ships here, they don't use nail, they use ropes. Yeah. And I think that the basic reason, probably, is that, as I mentioned there, that the rope is available everywhere around the Indian Ocean. Everywhere you have coconuts, you have ropes, easy to make. Everywhere you, uh, you have uh, for, forests, you get wood. So all the resources to build the dows are there. The question is learning how to, to build such a, uh, yeah. su such a dow. And here in terms of uh, leaking, of course, as we know, all boats leak all the time, mm. uh, the wooden boats. And this is why bailing out, I mean, the word itself is very common in English. You bail yes. out water uh, because some water will enter. And in, in uh, these sewn boats, because you are sewing it, um, there will be probably more open spaces. Yeah. Particularly with, uh, when, it, when the wood is dry. But one thing about the wood and even uh, the ropes is that once it gets water, it swallows water and expands and yeah. therefore tightens. Oh, tightens. okay. Got so it actually tightens um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the connections. And in fact, we constructed such a boat to put mm -hmm. in a museum in Zanzibar. Yeah. A, a life size, not just a small one, a life size about 13 meters long. And we get we got a fundi from Lamo to come and build it. And I supervised it and did the research. <clears throat> and when it was all ready to launch into the water, on the last day, the director comes and tells me that we can't launch into the into the water. I said, why? He said, Suppose it sinks, mm. and it's such embarrassment. I said, but we know, we are Swahili. <clears throat> we know that they leak. Yeah. And to, to, to sink there, people will learn why. <clears throat> he said, no, no, we can't do it now. <clears throat> yeah. So we did it a week later. And actually, I took precautions how to, to deal with that situation. If it does begin to, link, to sink, yeah. <clears throat> but we found actually it did not leak too much. We had to, to bail out water continuously yeah. um, uh, to keep it because it, was, it had been out for eight months. <clears throat> but the boat sailed on its own strength with, with the wind from there to the port itself before it was taken out. Right. So it worked and we proved it. And we have a a recording of this whole process. Yeah. Of course, Daos have a, a long and fabled history, um, you know, even before the, the, the current age. Um, but my earliest recollection of, of, of a Dao was when I was a little boy um, in East Africa, in Uganda, hearing the fact that one of my aunts, um, a, a teenage girl at the time, had to be smuggled out of Zanzibar um, during the early 60s at the time of the revolution, uh, along with other young women uh, from our community, uh, and had to be smuggled out 
in the in the steep of the night, in the deep of the night, um, on a, on a bell uh, to cross the to cross the ocean between Zanzibar and Dar uh, and get her to safety. Um, and so that was my earliest recollection of of thousand. And um, I, I, having read your book now, I am now determined that the next time I visit the East African coast, I want to go uh, on a on a on a voyage, on a short voyage on a dhow, because I think that would be fun. Yes. Um, slaves, uh, you, you, you quote in chapter six also, slaves had been one of the items of commerce in the Dao trade until the 19th century. Um, now, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Professor, with this question, but, but you'll allow me to just give a little bit of a preamble, uh, and I crave the patience of our audience too. The enslavement of Africans and Indian women for concubinage, and also trading them with Middle Eastern countries was clearly a lucrative uh, activity uh, conducted between various Muslim communities based around the Indian Ocean. In chapter 12, later on, when you discuss the Zanj rebellion, it is referred to as the Islamic slave trade. Uh, you then go on to state that not all Muslims at all times abided by the precepts of Islam as regards slavery. Um, and the Holy Prophet's desire to eliminate slavery was clearly something that much of his ummah was unfortunately unwilling to do. Um, probably invoking the fact that Islamic reforms helped to ameliorate the practice of slavery. But having said all that, when it comes down to it, the bottom line, could others, justifiably accuse Muslims of sheer hypocrisy if Muslims now criticize Britain and America for the Atlantic slave trade, because Muslims themselves conducted the slave trade in the Indian Ocean for many centuries. Is, is that justifiable? Yes, I, but I think we need to understand actually slavery, the, the way it comes about. Slavery is a very old institution. There are stories, as, as you know, even of the sons of prophets selling each other into uh, slavery. Yeah. Um, but what the prophet saw in Arabia at the, uh, at the beginning of Islam, what not slavery of that sort? It was really the captives in intertribal warfare between different Arab tribes they will fight uh, every season over water or uh, grass or whatever, and they will capture each other. And these will be captives. And they were called, um, uh, they were considered as, we, we, we would say, slaves. But yes. in the Quran, in the Quran, when these people are mentioned, they're not described as Abd. Abd the word Abd in Quran is used always in relation to servant of God, like um, Nabi Isa, when he was born and he was asked by the people know about you, he said, Inni Abdullah, mm -hmm. Atani al <clears throat> And one, some person in America did research and said, actually the word Abd is not used in the Quran at all to refer to slaves as we think. It is referred in the Quran by a long phrase, Ma malakat aymanuko, mm -hmm. those that your hands own Possess. or control. Ma right. malakat aymanuko. And it's mentioned about 29 times in the Quran. So these are the slaves. Now, but these slaves were these captives that I mentioned earlier between mm -hmm. the tribes. And this is why when you go through all the the, what the prophet says about Ma Malakat Aymanukum is how to treat them well. To treat them as if they are your own. If God wanted it, he could have made him your master, etc. It's yes. because he was aware that these are victims of tribal warfare. It is not going to be abolished. It's not going to disappear. Until mm. today, we have prisoners of war. So that is going to continue. Yeah. Now, but I think what is important that yes, later on during the, the caliphates, 
the Abbasid, Umayyad and Abbasids, people then began to really play around with what the Prophet said to begin to open um, possibilities of using slaves on yeah. a large scale. And even the word itself, Ab, began to be used more uh, towards these kind of slaves. And it became big business. Right. Um, and I think we cannot really hide the fact that there yeah. was slavery on a large scale in Iraq and in the 19th century Zanzibar as well. But I think one thing important, it was struck me when I was writing this book on slavery. Yeah. I wrote together with other scholars, is that even despite slavery being used in all its horrific uh, situations, being captured and being sold and etc. And yet the Muslims who owned these slaves in Zanzibar in the 19th century still behaved with their slaves differently from the way the British were behaving. And this yeah. is, you have to, to believe me, there is Bishop, uh, Bishop uh, Steer who built a church in Zanzibar, the first church, uh, which is still standing. Yes. He edited a book, a small booklet on slavery as it is in Zanzibar in 1872. And in the preface, he writes, and these are almost his words, I, I had the words. He says that the Arabs treat their slaves far better than we Englishmen treat our freed slaves. But he didn't stop there. I mean, he stopped there, he didn't say more. Yeah. But in that book, there's a whole chapter by doctor, a missionary doctor, Dr. Christie, who went into great detail to really detail how slaves were used, including particularly that uh, um, you were concerned about having uh, you know, Surya, having yes. slave wives. Yes, they, yeah. mm. uh, they organized. But see, the difference is this, that in the West, <clears throat> the slave owners slept yeah. with their slave wives. And yet, they did not give the children any status. Mm. They were mothers of slaves. I mean, their mothers were slaves, they were slaves, remained. But in the case of Muslim society, yes. an owner who has a relationship with a slave woman and a child, in other words, a, a surya, a child born is a fully legitimate child with full inheritance rights, right. including the throne, including the throne. So for example, in Zanzibar, after Sayyid Said, the big Sultan who ruled for a long time, he was succeeded by six Sultans in Zanzibar and Oman. And all of them were children of slave women. Right. But they, they were different. Um, so, there is a difference in terms of treatment, but yes, um, all of us reject the idea of ownership of slaves, a human being owning another one. Yes, right, right. but um, <clears throat> I think that difference also is very important. Yeah, it, I mean, it's also a notable fact that slavery wasn't formally abolished in Iran or Saudi Arabia until the early 20th century, um, yeah. which, uh, which is an indication. Um, okay, um, we're now at the half hour mark. Normally I would expect to see some questions from our listeners. There aren't any at the moment, so I'm gonna keep asking until I see some. Um, oh, hang on, I just saw one coming up. Okay, so let me just finish this one question uh, and then we'll move on to that. So tell us a little bit more about Sheikh Ibn Majid, the inventor of the Mariner's Compass and writer of navigational books like Al-Sufalia. Um, where was he from? Uh, how much of a debt does the maritime world owe him for his uh, efforts and endeavors in, in coming up with this compass and, and navigational charts and maps, etc.? Yeah. Well, he was definitely, even during his time, he was considered the master navigator yeah. of the Indian Ocean. Um, he lived a long period during uh, the 15th century. 
and died in fact around 1500. Um, and therefore the story that he was the one who took Vasco da Gama to India is not yeah. true. Okay. Uh, that was malicious. Uh, um, the person who took um, uh, Vasco da Gama was an Indian um, from uh, probably from Gujarat, who was considered a master and who right. took him there. In, but he is not guilty of what Vasco da Gama did. Um, he was a, an Arab who came from what is now Ras al Khaimah. It had a different name at that time, but it was Ras al Khaimah, his origin. But he traveled and he was actually the son of a, the son and a grandson of uh, <clears throat> mariners. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so during his lifetime, he wrote something like 40 manuscripts that have survived um, in Arabic. <clears throat> and including the one on Sufalia yes. uh, that, uh, uh, that I was interested in particularly. So he knew the sea extremely well. It will not be correct to say that he discovered the, mag the, the compass um, himself because magnetism was actually discovered by the Chinese, mm -hmm. which they began to use to find the North. But um, Ahmed the Majid comes from an Arab desert society where, where they use the, the stars. The, right. the knowledge of stars is what they were using to find out the north. So to know the north, you know uh, which um, star to follow. And on the basis of there, that they worked out this um, uh, illustration that appears in that book, where uh, you could at at sunset you you put your uh, four fingers against um, uh, the, um, the horizon. Yes. And if that star is at that level, yeah. you know the month and the direction and so on. Uh -huh. So the, it was really based on the knowledge of of stars. Yeah, um, and uh, so, and some of these books, I think a lot of them have been found, a lot of them have been studied, translated even into to Russian. There's a right. manuscript in Russia as well uh, of his. So he was a real master scholar during yeah. the 19th century. It ex in some ways explains the height of Arab uh, Muslim knowledge of, um, Navigation. Did you say 19th century? I thought it was earlier no, than that. No, 15th century. 15th century. Okay, I beg your pardon. Before the coming of the right. Portuguese. Right, right, exactly. Um, okay, now um, we are getting some questions, I'm pleased to say. Uh, however, in um, I'm going to handle these chronologically. So we, as you know, received two questions uh, in advance of today or ahead of today. Um, uh, both came from Kurban Manji. Um, so I'm going to ask you both of those, and if you comment briefly on those, and then we'll move on to the other ones. Is that okay? Yes, sure. The first one uh, from Kurban Bhai was, Kojas came to East Africa in Daos. Where can one find out more information about these vessels? Where were they constructed? Who built them? Physical size, cargo, and passenger capacity. Now, there is a, a chapter in your book that deals exactly with that. So my first inclination is to tell Kurban, read his book, but perhaps you'd like to give a, a more uh, um, overview of, of, of that. Yes. Well, I think actually um, a lot of the Indian ports uh, in Gujarat, but also on the Malabar coast, because yeah. you have timber, good timber from the Malabar coast. And so timber could be taken to Gujarat to, to build, or they were built on a large scale there. And uh, there were master uh, uh, people and who built these dows that could, uh, could sail uh, across. And the information about it, of course, uh, the dow trade has been declining. A lot of the ships are no longer built uh, uh, to, to travel, to do business, because the business has been taken over by steamships and uh, modern boats now. But um, there is a person called uh, Simpson, mm -hmm. uh, who is a, who's a professor at uh, 
University of London, School of Oriental and African Studies. He did his own main study um, on precisely this subject. Yes. And therefore, I mentioned um, a couple of uh, an article and a book that he has written. Yes. Then, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Kurbana, by uh, it would be a good place to start. He would have much more knowledge. I did not go into great detail. But yeah. um, one thing I do about this, that his knowledge of building um, DAOs still yes. continues uh, in, in Gujarat, um, although it is sort of surviving. Right. Uh, but uh, there was, there is actually one, uh, one Indian DAO that was built, built um, in, uh, in Gujarat. Yes, for an American um, ethnomusicologist, and he actually was playing around. He needed uh, uh, a DAO that he could go around, yeah. so he went uh, to India and got uh, himself one built, which was beautifully done. It was really quite well done, although he's a modern man. This American was modern yeah. man, so. He put an engine as well. He put uh, uh, modern uh, navigation equipment, but in yeah. such a way that it will not be seen. Right. And that when there is wind, he can sail. And that uh, ship, that DAO, came when I was working in the museum in Zanzibar. And yeah. I was surprised when I saw such a DAO because it has stopped coming now for mm -hmm. many, many years since the revolution. Mm. When I saw it, I really couldn't believe my eyes. Yeah, and I yeah. immediately went and then got the history, how it came to be built. Right. So th there is uh, uh, that kind of information. And, the, and the, um, I think the art of building those has not completely disappeared, but it yeah. is going down. When I last visited, well, the only time I visited the Kutch, I went uh, to Mandri, and I saw a lot of those being built but right. all of them had stopped construction right. because the business has had uh, departed. Yeah. Before I get on to Kurban Bai's next question, I just want to uh, send a quick uh, no, a message to Raza Bai Hirji, who has been eagerly putting his hand up, uh, waiting to ask a question. Raza Bai, if you could just hold off for a second, there's somebody ahead of you and I'll bring you on as soon as I can, okay? Um, so the second question from Kurban Bai, a slightly off topic, but nevertheless, um, of, of great interest to many in our community is how did Kojas in Zanzibar lose their language, Kachi or Gujarati, and adopt Swahili while still retaining their Koja culture? Well, I think that's a good question the way they uh, put as well. You see, it's not only Zanzibar, but all along the coast, the, the old coastal cities like Lamu, Old Mombasa, yeah. and Zanzibar, and Kilwa elsewhere. Many of the Kojas and other Indians migrated there before the British came. They were there earlier than the British. Yeah. So when they came, they, come, they came when the Sultan was ruling. Yes. And because the British were not there, they had not begin, begun to bring their racial separation policies. Right. Um, when they came at the end of the 19th century with colonialism, with the setting up of Kenya separately, Tanganyika separately, Zanzibar separately, especially mm. on the mainland and Kenya particularly, the racial divisions were very, very stark, very, very clear. Everybody was identified by race, knew where to build, and uh, which language to speak. In Zanzibar, the older Populations, whether in Zanzibar or in Lamu or in Mombasa, they had grown up under the Arabs who themselves were losing their language because they were speaking Kiswahili. So many of the Kojas in the 19th century were already speaking Kiswahili, were mm -hmm. even dressing like the Swahili, according yes. to Dr. Christie. He right. has uh, uh, about them as well. And so the language came earlier. And it became really part of the, our language, and we were speaking everywhere. Mm. It became what I can call, actually, my mother tongue. 
because the language that I spoke with my grandmother was in Kiswahili. And so it was nothing new. It was only my father late when I was already a teenager. He began to worry that yes. we are losing our mother tongue and we will lose our culture. And he began to insist on us speaking Gujarati. On the mainland, I think the colonial setup brought in this racial division much more starkly. Um, and I actually feel that Yes, the, the borders, for example, when I asked them, they said, our mullah tells us that our culture is in our language. Mm. I don't think that is necessarily so. Yes, language is part of the culture. But you can be, I can, like, as you said, that we can be Hoja and still speak Kiswahili. In Zanzibar, hardly any nationalist can speak, speak Kiswahili and speak uh, uh, any other language than Kiswahili at home. Yeah. And besides, I'm, I think the question will come up about Koja. This Koja fixedness on, on Koja identity, I'm quite worried about, but I think that will come probably later. Yeah. So let me stop there. Yeah. No, there there's a, there's a, a very amusing um, saying or or recount of of the uh the fact that kiswahili came from that part of the world zanzibar and it was told to me by a tanzanian gentleman and it goes something like this kiswahili was born in zanzibar it grew up in tanzania it fell sick in kenya it died in uganda and it was buried in rwanda and that's the same <laughs> well uh, let me immediate response to that one. In fact, uh, Kiswahili was not born in Zanzibar. Yeah. Uh, the Lamo people will say, no, no, this is the home. Yes. And it is growing. It is growing. It is the fastest growing African language in yeah. Africa. Now, it has begun to be adopted. I mean, it is being spoken in Rwanda, in Burundi. Of course, everywhere it goes. Yes. People will not speak the same way as they will speak in Lamu. Yeah. They will introduce their own way. The Snashri Gujarati, the Snashri Kiswahili in Zanzibar, yeah. is somewhat different as well. Yeah. So to be different is not as important, but it is not dying, it is growing. Great. Um, anyway, those are the two questions from Kurban Bai. Uh, I'm going to move to the first question we had on. Uh, on the text on the chat line and then and then move back to Razabai. So uh, today, when you travel from Zanzibar to the mainland, Professor, th hopefully, you know, through the waterways, what kind of old memories cross your mind? Um, and, and a follow up from the same person is during those days, uh, the size of Zanzibar comprised of coastal plain from Kenya all the way down to Kilwa, including Unguja Pemba Islands. However, today Zanzibar is only those two islands. How did this come about? Can you shed some light? So the first part of the question is, what memories cross your mind as you travel over from Zanzibar to the mainland? Uh, and then the second one is, um, how, did the, how did it come about that, that Zanzibar is now down to Unguja and Pemba? Well, actually for me, it's not much, right now if we cross, we are taking these uh, fast boats. Yes. Within two hours. Uh, you are in Dar es Salaam or in Zanzibar. Yeah, I took one your, a couple of years ago. Yes. Uh, unlike your uh, um, cousin or relative who had to be uh, smuggled out of Zanzibar, yes. by these, uh, there would be dhows or there would have been these uh, ngalawas, which yeah. were um, uh, the fishing boats with outriggers that right. can carry only maybe two or three people. Um, now, going by dhow, could take probably a whole day, and it would take a, a whole day because yeah. it depends on the local winds. Right. But, but for for coastal people like Zanzibar and so on, it is the sea itself that you are crossing the sea. That itself uh, creates uh, an, an atmosphere. That's my feelings. That if I don't see the sea for a very long time, my sister tells me the same thing. That I feel well. She said. She almost feels sick. 
not seeing the sea. Sea is very much a part of our life. Yes. To go to the sea, shore, listen to the waves, listen to even the sounds of the sea itself is really a great pleasure. Yeah. And that's why we, we used to like to go for our holidays to the beach. Um, now, the, the, so in terms of the feelings, now actually since I do it all the time, then there are no new feelings as such. Sometimes I'm sort of reading my mail or something. Yes. Um, and actually because of these uh, boats that are moving now uh, fast and so on, they've even driven away, I think uh, the fish that we used to cross. Yeah. In, the, in the initial days, when there were very few boats, motor boats that were going, you could see these flying fish sometimes. Right. Now you don't see them at all. Uh, so in some ways, mechanization has, is changing the sea. The second question about this, that Zanzibar at one time was the capital of what I call the, the commercial empire, where the Sultan did not actually rule a large part of East Africa, but mm -hmm. he controlled over most of the major ports and, and towns along the coast, where he establishes governors or uh, customs officials and so on. And therefore, he had influence along this uh, uh, thin strip of 10 miles yes. uh, along the coast. The 10 miles, of course, was determined by the Europeans. When, when the Europeans came at the end of the 19th century to try to divide up Africa between the various colonial powers, they could not ignore the fact that Sultan had control over yes. the coast. So they recognized this 10 mile strip as part of Zanzibar territory. Mm -hmm. And therefore it remained um, uh, as a, a separate, but only for a short while. Yeah. Because as soon as the Germans came into Tanganyika, and they could not allow the Sultan to control the coast mm -hmm. because well, there the ports will be, and they wanted to control. So they actually pressurized, threatened to blockade Zanzibar yeah. If the Sultan refuses to sell that strip to the Germans. Yeah. So he was forced to do it. In the case of Kenya, the British could not do, use the same tactic. So they said, okay, we will create a British protectorate here on yeah. the coast, like British protectorate in Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. And it will be under the flag of the Sultan. But that was it. Mm. Sultan had no control over the Kenya coast right. until independence came. And then, of course, at that time, it was ceded to Kenya. And uh, here it has already been taken by the Germans. So Zanzibar was left alone as a British protectorate, the two islands. <clears throat> and that's what became independent. Right. right. Before it was swallowed up by Tanganyika in Tanzania. Yes. Hello. Razabai, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Yeah. First and foremost, uh, Brother uh, Sharif, uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I really enjoyed this conversation uh, with Shabir Jafar, and uh, I definitely plan to read your book uh, more thoroughly than uh, the, the time we have been given today. But uh, my question to do has to do with the, uh, you have answered partially uh, from Kurban Manji's question regarding the importance of Swahili in the Zanzibari Indian culture, and not just the Kojas, but uh, most of the Hindus and Bohoras. I mean, I grew up speaking Swahili at home as being my mother tongue. And uh, when I went to Dar es Salaam I, to learn in Indian school, I was beaten up because I couldn't speak Gujarati. Uh, <laughs> having, ha having said that, the uh, my question is also, uh, you've answered the question that the British, the, uh, the Indians were, they blended very comfortably with the Africans and the, and the Arabs and Iranian as well uh, in Zanzibar, but the mainland people did not do that as much. Uh, but I also making an observation and I like your comments on it. The observation is that even besides the language of Swahili, even the way we think the culture of Zanzibari Indians 
and especially the Koja that I am, uh, are diff was, was quite different to the mainland Indian thinking style. And when the Zanzibari Ishnashti were moved to Dar es Salaam, they were even told, you know, you are like Africans, you don't have any culture behind you. Any, any observation from your part on this aspect of the cultural uh, between difference between Zanzibari, uh, Kojas, <laughs> and the, the uh, mainland? Well, I think actually in, in some ways, um, the, um, the Kojas on the mainland, many of them originated from Zanzibar or at the coast. Of course, there were some others who came later. Um, in the 19th century, 20th century, directly onto the, to the mainland uh, and went into the interior. <clears throat> but they were Kojas. I think the, in terms of um, assimilation, I think it's much more really that the longer period um, that they, these Kojas and other Indians were in Zanzibar or at the coast. <clears throat> and they tended to interact to uh, mingle with, uh, with the people uh, much more fully. I, for example, um, as you would know also, for primary school, I went to an Indian school in Zanzibar. It was called Yuan Smith Madrasa, because at that time there was still that kind of language and Gujarati was used as a teaching language there. But then when I went to secondary school, it was a uh, common. Indians, Arabs, Africans, all of them went to the same school. We had friends um, across all of this. We had a choice. And some of us had Arab friends, Indian friends, all of them. And it did not really, um, was not important for us to sort of distinguish. When you make choose friends, no, you have common interests and so on. I had the same experience as you had. Um, um, when I came actually before independence, I came here before I went to, to study, I think um, I came and I, we were actually beaten up by local uh, Indians here. And they called us uh, Jangbari Mama. Hmm. Um, actually beaten up. And I was surprised, surprised. I mean, what was the problem? Well, I had no problem with them. I didn't even know these people. Um, and yet, but I, I actually attribute a lot of this um, to the colonial situation where things were so compartment, compart compartmentalized according to race. And, and this is particularly true of Kenya and the interior, but here on, the, on the mainland also might be seen. I think a lot of Kojas probably who lived in the smaller villages, they have interacted uh, and intermingled with uh, the local population much more than in the towns where you have more chance of getting isolated in the stone town section uh, of this. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> it is true that um, um, the, f the fact that, I think the important fact is the longer period. But there are some, I was told by, uh, like I mentioned the Bohora, who's saying uh, that, uh, that uh, our culture is in our, uh, in our language, that it, there was a command by the mullah that language at home must be Gujarati. Yeah. And Surti Gujarati, not any Gujarati, Surti yeah. Gujarati. Mm -hmm. And I find actually even in Zanzibar, the Bohoras until today, they still speak Gujarati at home. And even those, I have a friend of mine who is a Bohora, who is a bit uh, outgoing. And so he has a lot of friends who are Swahili, speaks Kiswahili with them. And I also do the same thing. When I meet him, I start talking with him in Kiswahili. And he asks me, why are you, are you not talking Gujarati? Mm. I said, why? why you are talking Kiswahili with everybody? Why yeah. should we not? I said, no, no, no. Between us, we must talk Gujarati. Uh, so it, in some ways it is ingrained. The fact that, and I think this is one, the fact that 
the coaches in Zanzibar, after we became Snashris, we did not have such a central figure like Daga Khan or the Mullah right. to, con to impose any kind of restrictions. We were much more open democratic and therefore more rebellious and fighting among ourselves also a lot. <clears throat> so I think that must be one of the reasons that we didn't have that kind of central le leadership. Razabai, thank you for your question. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on here. Um, we are actually at the end of our hour, but uh, this is a fascinating subject, and I believe the professor is okay for us to continue. Are you, professor? Just for yes, a few I, more minutes? Okay. Yes, yes. So we, thank you. We have a question from Sister Sabika Shaban. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Professor. Um, I came across your book actually uh, two years ago as a recommendation from an anthropology professor, and um, it was one of the most amazing, incredible, in-depth storytelling narratives that I've come across in a long while. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I resided in the Gulf for most of my life, and I've never seen it as being part of, as you mentioned, the largest cultural continuum in the world. So it was, it was very, um, it was, it was, it was a very, it was an eye opener. So uh, my question is, and it's more of a generic question, I suppose, that do you feel that rediscovering some of these histories, essentially, if you will, um, decolonizing our curricula, learning some of this in our schools, can bring back some of that solidarity and tolerance that would exist back then between, you know, Africans, Iranians, um, Arabs. Southeast Asians, if you will. Thank you. I think I do not know because, it, uh, for example, in in the Gulf, many of these uh, uh, states were under kind of British protection and so on. Um, and yet there, uh, people do live rather separately. And I think there is a, a lot to do with the fact that the discovery of oil, the wealth that came um, to uh, to the Arabs, and then under these conditions, uh, large numbers of uh, Asians coming there essentially as servants uh, or uh, employees and so on, it creates a situation which is really I found it actually uncomfortable myself. Uh, when I went back to Zanzibar after three years in Dubai, I lived in Dubai for three years, and people would ask me, and uh, so how many friends did you make among the and uh, the Emiratis, I said, the only Emirati that I knew were the ones who came behind in, in their car with a horn honking to get out of their way. <laughs> and I think there is that kind of arrogance in, in the society. But in some ways, that is probably a misjudgment going rather harshly. But I think it is true. I had only one friend out of three years. And he happened to be walking in the same place I was walking. That's how I came to, to be close to him. Now, so I do not know that it's the modern wealth and, and arrogance of people that also is in it. I think here we can, uh, in Zanzibar definitely it is very easy to intermingle with people because the society is very open. Um, you can go to any of these barazas at the intersections of roads and so on, you have your cup of coffee and you find people of all uh, races there sitting there talking, playing and so on. And you sit there and you have your drink, you make friends very easily. So in Zanzibar, it would be possible. Dar es Salaam, not as much. It is because it is really a very modern city. There are no such um, barazas unless you probably go, go to Kariako and then you'll find some. Yeah. So. Times also are changing, life is also changing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and sneak in one more question and then uh, preview our next uh, uh, writer who's going to be joining us next month. So everyone, please, uh, please uh, stay on the line uh, while I do that. Um, Professor, in chapter 15, the last chapter called Mer Liberum, uh, a Latin expression and its antithesis, you herald the arrival of the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean area at the end of the 15th century. Uh, and you quote, and I quote, and with it a new concept of armed trading, trade monopolies, a crusading spirit and territorial conquest. 
quite different to what we had seen before. So the question is, did the maritime communities of the region, uh, particularly the Muslim ones, ever recover fully from the Portuguese incursions? And, and how much of a contrast was there between, for example, Zheng He's expeditions, the, uh, the, the, the explorer from China, and Vasco da Gama's in terms of their attitude and their behavior towards the people of the region? Well, I, I think actually, definitely the coming of the Portuguese, because they were the first Europeans coming in force. Previously, there were individual Europeans traveling uh, to uh, the East Indies and so on, coming to India, but there were very few. But in terms of coming in large numbers, this was uh, the, the first time. And they came in force, you know, with, with uh, the, ben, uh, the banners and the sword and, and everything. Yeah. Um, and actually, they, it's amazing. I, find it, I found it amazing to realize that Portugal was a small country of 1.5 million people. 1.5 million people. And, they, and yet they wanted to rule the whole of the Indian Ocean. Mm. There was no way that they could have done it. They didn't have the manpower mm. to, to rule it. So what they did was, and quite strategically, when they came, um, they said, to control the Indian Ocean, they were interested more in trade uh, at that time, the spice trade. They wanted one port in East Africa, to, uh, as a jumping off place to go to India. So yeah. eventually they chose Mozambique. They wanted Pilwa, but uh, could get it initially. And then they wanted Aden at the mouth of the Red Sea. They wanted Hormuz at, um, at the mouth of uh, the Persian Gulf, Gulf. Mm. and Malacca in the East Indies yes. and, uh, to control the, the states of Malacca. So they wanted to control these so that to be able to control all the trade, especially the spice trade. And, and they, they had force at the beginning uh, with people and fighting and so on. But ultimately, they didn't have the manpower to dominate. So within a century, two centuries, they had begun to, uh, to fade. But what they did was to establish a new pattern of European domination, which was followed <clears throat> by the Dutch, the French, and then of course the British. And under them, the same kind of approach to, to trade. It was no longer the pre-1500 trade, where all the, the traders were free to, to move without ruling all of mm. these spots. Mm. And the people who actually controlled the Indian Ocean before 1500 were no big states, not the Mughals or the, the, the Chinese, but there were these small city states like Kilwa, Mombasa, Zanzibar. All of them were independent. All of them were trading almost on an equal basis. So in some ways, uh, the new situation uh, came with the Europeans. The gates were opened by the Portuguese, but occupied by others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, fascinating indeed. Uh, Professor, thank you again uh, for joining us today. I, I, I mean, I still had, I don't know, half a dozen questions left remaining to ask you, uh, but the time just zoomed by. So um, I will say to all our listeners, um, I hope you enjoyed the session. It will be, it has been recorded and will be up on our website within a couple of weeks. Um, so if you want to share it with anybody who you think might be interested, please do so. Uh, but in the meantime, once again, Professor, thanks again for, for joining us. Thanks for writing this book. Um, and uh, we wish you well um, in, in, in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Um, a quick preview of the next session for everyone's benefit. Um, in July, I will be... Um, talking to an author based in Toronto by the name of S.K. Ali, Sajida Ali, who is a writer of uh, children's and young adults book. She's just published this book called Once Upon an Eid. Um, and she's co-written it 
uh, with a lady by the name of Aisha Saeed. Um, for those of you who don't know, SK Ali is a, uh, a writer of children's books and, and young adult books. And she wrote that particular uh, notable award-winning book called The Proudest Blue, which was uh, based on the, and, uh, on the, on the uh, experience of uh, Ibtihaj Muhammad, the Olympic athlete. Um, or the Olympian. Um, anyway, she's just published Once Upon an Eid. It's a collection of, of different stories by different Muslim writers. I'll be talking to her on July 24th at the same time, 12 noon. Um, and in addition to her books, I'll be asking her something that's very topical. And that is during the, since COVID, um, it, has been, it, it has been shown that children's literacy levels, their reading abilities has been affected by the fact that they've not been in school for much of the time or, or had to uh, uh, cope with online learning. And so uh, the, the, the numbers are coming out that literacy levels are declining um, or have been impacted, should I say. And so I'm gonna be asking her not only about her books, but about what can be done and what the role of books, children's books and young adults books can play in helping address this issue. Um, and I'm hoping she can shed some insights and, and, and uh, uh, Give some some thoughts on that. So uh, please do join us. And if you know of any young um, parents, uh, parents of young kids, should I say, who may be interested in, in hearing her thoughts on this, please spread the word. Um, so in the meantime, uh, I will bring this to a close. Thank you again, Professor. And thank you to all our listeners for faithfully tuning in. Uh, I wish you all a very good weekend. Good afternoon.